I am Katie Overmeyer. I am a staff scientist here in Josh Kuhn's group at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I'm here with Ed Hutland, uh, who's a fabulous scientist as well, and he's going to be talking a lot about his, uh, we're going to be discussing data analysis strategies and some Q&A here today, this morning. Ed, would you like to say any more uh, introduction? Uh, um, sure, I'll just uh, say, uh Hi to everyone. Uh, thanks to, to you and Josh and the rest of the organizers for organizing this event and inviting me to participate. And I'm looking forward to uh, taking your questions this morning and then also speaking later today. Uh, so we will be monitoring this chat. Uh, feel free to ask your questions uh, in, the, in the chat um, window here. We also got a question, some questions um, before uh, yesterday. Um, and then those are will be presented on the screen, but uh, between questions, if we see ones pop up in the chat, we'll, we'll go ahead and address those as they come up. Uh, so the first one we have is, are there any new tools for high dimensional data set analysis and besides dimensionality reduction um, strategies? Uh, Ed, would you like to take that one first? And sure. I'm happy to happy to jump in. So this this is a this is certainly a good question. I mean, high high dimensional data sets. It's uh, always becomes a challenge what you should do with the data, and part of that's because there are so many different options. Um, so so many different options that it almost becomes a little bit um, tricky to figure out where to start with answering this one. I guess what I would say is that what my approach when I when I see a large data set will be to uh, you know, there's certain analyses that I'll do as sort of quality control at the beginning, but then I'll go into it with, with certain questions in mind. And the tools that I use and things like that will very much be tailored to the types of questions that I have. In the area of you know high dimensionality, um, you know dimension reduction, that sort of thing, there is a lot that's been developed. Um, there has, has been a lot of new things developed. I mean, there's the old standby PCA, which of course uh, works very well, but there are newer techniques, UMAP, um, and even some some things coming out of deep learning with auto encoders and things like that that can work very well. Having said that, I'd say you know 95% of the time I just end up doing PCA and then and and that gets me where I, I need to be for for most of the purposes. But there are other other alternatives that are out there um, for other kinds of questions that you might do. Uh, I mean certainly there are. Um, approaches coming online every day that will take your high dimensional data set. Maybe it's protein expression across a bunch of different conditions or something like that and merge it with other data types. Maybe it's protein interaction networks. Um, there's a lot of protein interaction data that that um, I've been generating with with my uh, colleagues at Harvard in the last uh, number of years. Um, there's um, you know different types of omics data. The, the Kuhn lab has done a lot with this combining proteomics with metabolomics and genomics now. And certainly there, there are methods that are coming online. Um, at some point you start running into cases where you need to develop your own tools, but um, it's it's certainly improving every day. I'd say the the types of options that are out there um, there for some things like network based analysis. There are tools like um, Cytoscape that, are, that have a lot of built in tools and plugins as well that can be useful if you want to go the network route. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's a lot of different options to consider. I know Katie, if you've got any any thoughts on on this one as well. I would second that having that second dimension there really helps and, and that could be biology dimension or, or whatever your question of interest. Uh, we leverage a lot of correlation analysis to get like a filter or a screen down some or filter down some of that, that data that we have. Um, I use that quite often in like multiomics integration, looking at things which are both significant and whatever model system I care about and also correlated with something else, right? And so that can reduce this data set quite a lot. Um, and I think there are many different types of orthogonal data you can put into this uh, and doing clustering type analyses. Um, WGNCA is one that's quite common for cluster analysis, but I think any time that you can sort of combine like with like or things which are changing similarly that might help you tease apart more biology or more your system, whether that's you know, system of choice. Yeah. So uh, 
That sounds good. We can move on to another question that we have. And <laughs> do I need to normalize my data? Uh, and I think we get that quite often in our lab. I don't know, Ed, if you have that similar situation in your lab and maybe strategies or considerations when we're thinking about normalizing data. Um, yeah, we, we definitely get this question a lot where we get its close cousin, the uh, how should I normalize my data? Yeah. And uh, so between the two of those, and in, uh, I guess my take on this one is that uh, in basically every scenario, you do need to do some sort of normalization. What the normalization is going to be, can can that can be a complicated question because it really depends on the nature of your data. How did you acquire it? Um, what are the uh, what are the different experimental variables that went into it? And then also, what are you going to do with the data afterwards? Uh, that makes a big difference as well. And the the other thing that that we found is is a challenge with normalization is that there are a lot of different approaches to take, and it's not always obvious which one is the right one. Um, so you, you can try a bunch of different normalization strategies and, and after a while you can almost drive yourself crazy wondering, well, did I did I make things better? Did I make things worse? How you know, what did I do? And so I, I guess maybe what I'll do or I could say a little bit about um, some of the approaches that we've taken um, and to say that you know, usually with these sorts of things, it, it helps to have an idea of, uh, always to keep a goal in mind at the end of like, what is the analysis that you want to do? And have some ideas of some metrics that you're going to use as you decide how to handle your data to figure out if you're happy with the normalization or not. So I guess maybe, it, I mean, normalization comes up in, in every, every experiment you're looking at for a lot of different reasons. Um, I, I guess I'll use isobaric labeling or TMT as an example because we do a lot of that in the lab. And so you you go through, you, you do your experiment measuring your protein, you know, abundance changes across a bunch of different samples and you prep the samples, but then there, there's a lot that you have to do. Like maybe you start out with equal amounts of cells, maybe you normalize to the total amount of protein midway through your prep. But by the time you actually get to the instrument, there will be experimental error that has come in even within a single TMT experiment. So if you have 16 samples or whatever in your experiment. You know, even if you started out with the same amount of material, there will be little differences that come in. So that's something you want to to normalize out and there. And the way we usually handle that is to assume essentially to adjust all the columns to get them to sum to the same amount of total TMT signal. Label three, this sort of thing comes up as well, too, and that like each run, uh, particularly if you're doing a lot of runs, there can be changes in like the overall signal intensity from run to run. You have to at some point start to correct for that. Otherwise, you'll start to get variables. So there's there's that level of correction that may be necessary. Now, we've also done experiments in the lab where we'll we'll be going across multiple TMT experiments. Um, my colleague David Nusino did an experiment, uh, a ran an experiment a couple of years ago looking at something like 300 different cancer cell lines putting them all together into one experiment. So that's a lot of different TMT experiments collected over a long period of time. And so then uh, when you start doing it that way, you have to do an extra normalization step to get from one TMT experiment to the next because there will be differences um, based on instrument performance, based on the particular uh, cell lines that are present in each one. And so he had to spend a lot of time troubleshooting, like, like months troubleshooting that one normalization step to figure out how to, how to really make it work. And what he ended up settling on was essentially assuming that the, the median abundance of each protein would be equal from TMT plex to TMT plex. And on and the way that he, he arrived at this as being the, uh, the right answer for looking at this particular type of data was, um, I mentioned that it's a good idea to have certain metrics in mind. So there are a couple of things that, that he wanted to keep track of. One is that if you uh, take your, your data set at the end and you look at how it clusters, if you're looking at a bunch of different cancer cell lines, as an example, you don't want it to cluster by your TMT plex in the first dimension. You don't want that to show up at all. You want to make sure that you're clustering based on something that's biologically meaningful, uh, whether it's you know um, the nature of the of the the cell type, epithelial epithelial versus mesenchymal, or you know maybe tissue of origin or something like that. But what he found early on was that they would actually cluster based on the TMT plex. So that was a that was a red flag that something wasn't right. And so he tried a bunch of different normalization strategies and would, would adjust different things and would measure how well they were doing based on how well um, they broke up that signal the, the, and, and allowed other patterns in the data to come out. 
And ultimately, he, he knew that he, he had come up with something he was reasonably happy with when he found that uh, looking at the, the, the first, you know, the main dimension of clustering and, and even you know, the, the finer structure of the, the clustering network as well, that you'd get away, that, that, it was, um, that it was looking like biological signal as opposed to technical artifacts. So that's absolutely something to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, yeah, it, it really does depend on, on the particular um, experimental situation that you're looking at. And so it's a little hard to make um, make broad suggestions other than that. I don't know what, what your feeling is. No, I definitely have had the same situation and have observed it also where it's a month long or months long process to figure out a way to reduce that, particularly technical variance. So we will often, a lot of times with metabolomics data or our lipidomics platforms, which are shorter runs, we can pepper in a lot more pooled control sample. So we have a quality control that gets run every six samples or so, and that's a good way for us to look at variation over time and variation which might be driven by instrumental noise or drift. Um, and so our metric for that is often to look at relative standard deviations among those controls and then across days of analysis. And there is always some uh, adjustment that needs to be made. I agree, it's quite common that we would need to do some sort of normalization. Um, and transformation, I think we didn't talk about that too much, but you know, we often do log transform our data to put it into some, some sort of normal distributions. Um, and that's a good thing to consider as well, like what the distribution of your data look like. Um, Actually, or, no, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, so along those same lines, it occurred to me that there, there are, uh, you know, you absolutely do want to normalize your data, but it, it occurred to me that it's always good to be mindful when you when you do a normalization, you're making certain assumptions. And so it's, it's, it's a good idea to be aware of what those assumptions might be and to think about whether they apply. So one example that I give is like, um, I was talking about this protein ex experiment earlier where um, we're measuring protein abundance across, you know, a dozen different samples and we're expecting um, the same abundances from sample to sample. Um, that might be true if you're doing a protein, uh, just comparing, you know, protein abundance in a bunch of in a bunch of samples is probably true if you've normalized to a protein assay or something like that. But there's scenarios where that can get you into trouble. One example that we've come up with is phosphorylation. Frequently when we do phosphorylation, we're not just looking at steady state levels. We will take a cell line, we'll stimulate it in some way, and then we want to measure that stimulation, see how the phosphorylation changes. Now the problem with this is that at time zero, you're probably expecting very little phosphorylation compared to what you're going to see you know, if, if your five minute time point or whatever your time points are after that, you're probably going to see phosphorylation going up, maybe across the whole thing, maybe it goes up and comes back down. Either way, you don't want to be assuming that the amount of phosphorylation is the same in all of those things. Otherwise, you're going to completely, you know, get rid of the signal that you care about and distort your data. So it's definitely something to, to think about when you're when you're looking at these things. What what, are the, what is the experiment? What is going to be a reasonable way to do the normalization? Phosphorylation is actually really hard. What we'll frequently try to do in these cases is we'll try to prep the samples, look at the levels of total protein um, prior to the phosphorylation enrichment step, and then we'll do our normalization based on the levels of non-phosphorylated protein to correct for um, you know, sample loading and so forth upstream. And that's that's been the best approach that we've come up with. Um, but it, it really does depend. So I would definitely encourage you if you're thinking about how to normalize your data to think through what, what's implied by the normalization steps you're trying, what assumptions are in there, and do they really apply to the, uh, to the experiment that you're doing? Yeah, I would second that with, uh, we definitely see this in a lot of metabolomics data that certain metabolites will, will change quite a lot. And so if you're doing any sort of some normalization, you might actually reduce other useful information when you do that um, because you have really high extreme changers and the similar case to the phosphorylation. So I, I do think it is your dependent on your data set and use caution. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that was excellent discussion about normalization. We have a couple questions here in our um, chat. 
The first one is I'm new to multivariate analysis of mass spectrometry data. Are there any resources to define, explain uh, when to use models? For example, PCA, PLSDA, OL, PL, OPLSDA. Um, it is alphabet soup sometimes if you're new to this uh, arena. <laughs> So that's that's a good question. Yeah, there, there are all these different techniques uh, that that you can uh, that you can try, and and uh, you'll you'll this happens all the time. Like you pick up a paper, they do some cool analysis. You look at the back, and and there's some new abbreviation in there. And so, how can you learn about it? I will say that the, the tools and resources out there for learning these kinds of things have, I mean, they they've just ballooned. They've exploded in the last you know five years, ten years or so. For things like PCA that are very well established. There are so many resources you can find. There are free online courses from Coursera and so forth that will go through and explain these things in in an excellent in excellent detail. Um, you can find some of those things on YouTube as well. Um, for for some of the other techniques, that become a little bit more specialized. Then it, it um, the, even then there's still frequently interesting blogs and things like that you can find from people who do like um, you know data science and things like that. Like it's it's being a uh, sort of a hot area, you know, there, there are a lot of people who will be putting out a lot of resources discussing some of these things and just a, a simple Google search will will bring up a lot. Um, for as far as more formal uh, references, there's um, there's a book by, oh, let's see, it's Trevor Hasty, uh, Daniela Witten, um, and oh well, Tip Sharani. There are like three or four people who are on this, like the statistical analysis of data. That's actually it's it's got like a yellow cover with a with a black bar on it. You can actually download a PDF for free from the author's website, or you can buy it. But that's an excellent resource. I, I will go to that for a lot of these tech techniques when I want to know the details because they do. You know, they're they're all you know excellent statisticians, so they will go into some of the detail. But they also, I think, do a pretty good job of providing sort of a, an, an intuition in their description or providing a, a a more accessible description because sometimes you want to know the, the details but more often you you really just want a general overview of like what, what's the big picture of what they're trying to do here um having said that my other piece of advice i guess would be like especially if you're if you're just starting out it can be tempting to try every tool you come across and, and there's there's value to that in some sense at the same time i will say that you know you can get a long way with just the basics. So, you know, I, you know, it's rare that, you know, I'll frequently just do PCA for dimensionality reduction and that that does the job and and that's enough. And so that's usually where what I what I will that's my go-to tool for that sort of thing. Um, so my my I would probably encourage you, you know, certainly, you know, experiment a little bit, but it can be overwhelming at first. So maybe pick a few tools and is as your home base, get comfortable with those, and then add things as you as you need them based on specifically what they do. And I guess the other thing I'd point out is like of the examples that you um listed there, like they, they do they all relate to dimensionality reduction in one way or another. Uh, they differ in exactly how they do it. It's like PCA, you're just trying to reduce the dimensions based on the total variance in the different samples you're looking at. If you're going to something like partial least squares or the or the OPLSDA, then you're you're also reducing the dimensionality, but you're doing it with respect to another response variable. Uh, and so that that becomes a, a little bit different question. So you're you're not just trying to figure out how to you know compress the samples down based on on the the total variance. You're trying to you know, compress them down in such a way that the remaining dimensions do a good job predicting the response variable. And so um, the reason why I point this out is because some of these tools are useful because they do something that's fundamentally different. And so that that's the other thing to keep in mind is like, you know, matching each tool to the specific application that you that you have. That was an excellent response. Yeah, that knowing the delineation between a supervised, which is when you have an orthogonal piece of information like the response variable and a non-supervised, which is more an open-ended kind of discovery approach. Um, and both, I would I would say most cases you want to apply both to your, your problem. It's good to look at that in a, both a supervised, your data, whatever that looks like in a supervised way um, and an unsupervised way. Uh, we have another question here, which is if I am just starting out in research and I'm not familiar with data processing programs, do you have any recommendations for programs I should become familiar with? 
Yeah, so I guess, let's see. So data processing, I guess, could mean a couple of different things. There'd be like going from ROM aspect data to if you're in proteomics, protein identifications or in metabolomics, getting metabolome, uh, metabolite IDs, things like that. Um, and so for that sort of thing, I mean, you, there are actually a number of choices that are that are pretty good. MaxQuant is certainly uh, an excellent place to get started. I mean, it's it's a very reliable tool. It's uh, you know kind of a standard in the field, and also there are a lot of resources to learn it. Um, there's in fact last week was the the annual Mass, uh, Max Quant Summer School. The nice thing about uh, the summer school, they have like a week's worth of lectures to go through both the basics and the details of how they do it. Uh, how they do the analyses they describe, but then they also will they put all those things online. So they're on, on YouTube. You can look them up and and go back if you're if you're learning it after the fact. And so that's that's a tremendous resource. Um, Alexei Nesvisky from Michigan has developed a, a whole pipeline of tools himself for proteomics. Um, Bragg pipe he calls it, which is uh, which. Um, is also a very useful set, provides some some unique capabilities. Even software packages like Proteome Discoverer from Thermo have gotten to be um, good options. So from that standpoint of like converting mass spec data to proteomics results, those would be three things I would check out. If you're interested in the next step after that, which is like, I've got my list of proteins, how do I, um, you know, how, how do I analyze them beyond that? How do I do clustering? How do I do PCA? How do I do, the statistical tests that I want to do to compare, you know, the mutant versus wild type, or whatever the experiment might be that you're you're looking at, um, then then uh, the place I would start honestly is Perseus. Um, it's a a nice package also from from Jurgen Cox um, that's sort of a companion to MaxQuant, although you can actually bring data into Perseus just from a, a text file, so that makes it really easy to. Uh, easy to work with, like you can bring data into Perseus from, from any source, and it gives you point and click access to a lot of the tools that you're gonna want for basic analysis of, of not just proteomics, but really omics data sets as well. That would be where I would start. Certainly if, you, uh, if you're interested in learning some, some coding and things like that, and, and I, I, I do encourage everybody to, to learn some basics. R is a good option. There, there are lots of resources for learning R. Um, Python can be a good option too. I don't have a strong feeling about which one of those two would be would be preferable. Probably what I would do is um, take a look at what other people in your lab are using, and uh, because there's an advantage to having a critical a critical mass of people in the group using the same like the same um, you know environment, I guess. So like if everybody's writing R code, then you can share code, you can help each other. Uh, if everyone's writing Python code, same sort of thing. Um, but that's to be honest with you, that's where I would uh, that's where I would get started. There's another tool that I really like, um, and it's uh, Metabo Analyst. It's another kick, click and play version, um, slightly different setup as Perseus, but it's a web based portal, and you can intended for metabolomics data set, uh, but you can I'm sure leverage the tools for other other types of data as well. Um, and they have a lot of these more complicated analyses like uh, PLSDA and random forests, which is another kind of supervised um, prediction algorithm strategy you can you can apply. So I would also recommend checking that one out. Metabol Analyst is um, a really great click and play tool if you want to get sort of familiar with different techniques you could apply. Um, and I would second the having a code based, um, doing stuff in, in uh, R or Python um, really helps with reproducibility. And that's something we haven't really talked about yet, but having a ability to go in and redo this analysis again is really critical and having the steps along the process that you did to do that. And so a code is essentially a notebook that you can go back and, and recycle or redo that analysis again because maybe you realize oh you're missing a piece of data and you need to put it in i definitely just had that experience happen where i'm like oh i need to rerun all this code and it was simple because i had that sort of notebook to go back and kind of run through uh, so that is an advantage um, for going into a code-based analysis versus something um, like uh, Excel, which is obviously you can do a lot of these things in Excel as well. Like you can do um, 
t-tests and you know heat maps and, and there, there are some sort of simple stuff you can do in excel and the nice thing about perseus is that they do also help with that log so tracking as you go and, and metabolomics as well like kind of logs the steps of your process as you go so both of those if you want click and play options are it's a better than an excel option I'll just uh, jump jump into to uh, emphasize that point. That, like th those are those are two excellent excellent points that uh, you know the software doing, doing the software based analysis can be can be great. It's super useful, but keeping having a record for what you did so that you can run the software again, or just so that you can go back and recreate it if, if you need to, is a huge huge advantage. It, it, uh, we mentioned Excel, and so and I actually Excel has its place. It's a great way to like browse through data and so forth. I've I've known people who set things up to do like fairly complicated analyses in Excel, 15 steps, 20 steps. They start working their way through it. Someone comes over to ask them a question and they're, when they're halfway there and, and they realize they don't know what they've done. Or someone will come with a spreadsheet and they'll be like, well, here, here's my data, but uh, you know, can you work with this? And then we realize that we can't figure out what happened to it. So Having having code that that will show you exactly what you did that provides a record you can go back to allows you to redo analyses without really any more work in your part are huge advantages. And as we talk about things like data reproducibility, record keeping, and all that, that's that's extremely extremely important and and a big advantage once once you get ready to to take that that step. And I think more and more we're seeing this come up in journals requiring that you do have so sort of that record keeping in place when you do publish a data set that's doing data analysis with mass spectrometry data or really any other data. Um, particularly like the bigger journals, like they'll require that you make your code available or that your processing steps are really well like described. Um, so in, in that regard, it's good to keep notes as well. And it will come back <laughs> at some point in the process. You'll you'll need to kind of readdress that again. Well, we had another question, which is a little outside of uh, data analysis, but may be relevant to you. Is this uh, can you review DDA versus DIA? And this would be for um, presumably proteomics analysis um, and comment on your views for these methods in different omics fields for the future. Um. All right. Yeah. So I guess the, yeah. So this is this is a fairly proteomics specific question, I guess. And so the way to think about it is: so in your typical bottom-up proteomics experiment, you've got your peptide mixture that you're separating on the column. It's going into the instrument, and then the instrument is collecting MS1 data, measuring the intact masses of peptides as they come through. And now we know that we want to collect MS2 data. The question is: how are we going to do that? Now, traditionally, the way people would do this is that you know, you know, 25 years ago, they would actually literally sit there at the instrument. They would see the MS1 features come up on. They'd say, oh, I'm interested in that one. They'd type in the mass. It would get selected, they'd fragment it, and they'd, get just that, you know, they'd select just that one ion, fragment it, collect the MS2, and then they'd go on to the next one. Now, eventually, they automated this, proce this procedure, and this became data-dependent analysis, where the instrument is essentially collecting MS1s, looking at the features as they come by, and then picking them one at a time and saying, I'm going to I'm going to go after this one, then that one, then that one. And it usually goes through starting with the most abundant features, working its way down. And then after it goes after a feature, it excludes that or Z for a while. Um, and so this, yeah, this can be a very good way to do it. This was how proteomics was was done for a long period for a long period of time. The advantage is that you get nice pure MS2 spectra. Well, relatively pure. It, it's it, they're, they're never completely pure. But you get these MS2 um, spectra that you can look at for each peptide, and you can put these into algorithms to search. Now, the problem is that the, our samples are frequently complex. You can't, um, you're not going to have time, even if it's a, you know, you fractionate and other things like that, to um, sequence every single peptide in a given run in the time that you have. Each scan takes a certain amount of time. And so there, you just there, there's not enough time in the in the the duration of the run to get everything you want. So people eventually came up with the idea. Well, maybe maybe I don't want to target every peptide individually. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just say I'm going to go through and I know the mass range that I care about. I'm going to just step through, isolate a wider range. So maybe 25 MOZ or something like that. Isolate all the ions that are coming out in that range, 
fragment them all together, cycle through to that across the entire M over Z range that I care about, then go back the next you know, and do that again, just repeat that throughout the run. So now, instead of looking at the features as they come out, we're executing a predetermined program where we just go through and collect MS2s of particular regions in stepwise fashion. And then see so each MS2 is now many different species put together but you have every MS2 repeatedly throughout the run. So you can start to then use the chroma, chronographic separation. Um, you can look at essentially how the different peaks that you're pulling out correlate, and you can sort of figure out which ones go together and then use that information. Um, in, in fact, actually, yeah, you, you can start to skip the MS1 step altogether um, if, if, you, if you want and just look at how the fragments are coming out. Then you can either match these fragmentation patterns to spectral libraries, you can, uh, or, or you can actually search them you know, it, with database searching tools and so forth, much like DDA. And so these have sort of become two different approaches of going about it. Advantages of each one, um, DDA, I think from the, num from the examples I've seen, although it's getting closer and, and closer, DDA will sometimes give you a, a bit deeper analysis in uh, if you're looking at like just one sample or a few samples. But if you look across a large number, you get more missing values. DIA will give you a very defined number of IDs. So maybe it's not quite as many as you would have gotten from DDA on the same sample, but you're going to get them almost every single time. And so if you're doing large numbers of samples, this can potentially have some advantages because uh, if you're running 100 samples or something like that, you, in order for it to be useful, you need to see a protein in the majority of those, if, if not all of those. Um, my feeling on it is that they're, you know, they both, yeah, right now I'd say they're both very viable techniques for um, proteomics analysis. Uh, and you know, if if you're gonna start doing, if you just if you want to survey the, uh, do a basic proteomics survey experiment, um, there are tools and techniques and methods in place right now where you can do a very good job using either either approach. Um, I think it's uh, let's see, I, I think it's not. I'm not sure that there's necessarily a huge advantage, but I think they both have important parts to play as we go forward in uh, in different kinds of analyses. Um, and so I think I think it's uh, it's yeah they're they're both going to be valuable co contributors. Yeah. Thanks. So I think. I am not seeing any additional ones in the chat, so we can return back to um, the slide. Oh, do you have there's, a? There's one question that came up that uh, a quick one. It was like, could you chat out the citation of this paper? So I think that might have been the paper I mentioned from David Nusino uh, when I was talking about this this large cancer cell line uh, experiment. I don't have the citation handy, but I can tell you that his name's David Nusino, and it was published in Cell in 2020, and he also has a bioarchive paper. Where, that he put in, where where he actually describes in great detail his procedure for optimizing his um, his normalization strategy for that data. So I, I uh, what I'd say is maybe I'll I'll look it up after the the session or something. In in but but uh, my recommendation would be uh, basically look up uh, David Nusino and and look for his cell paper and look him up in bioarchive and you'll find the two papers that are relevant. Um, so we have another question, which is how do I account for batch effects in mass spectrometry data? And I think we talked about this a little bit in normalization, um, but I will put out there one other common tool that we have used, and I, maybe Ed, you can talk about whether you use it or not. Um, and that would be in R, there's a package, uh, SVA is the package name, and it's called combat is the function. And it does um, batch effect normalization on sort of a, uh, orthogonal plane sort of dimensionality reduction approach. Um, so versus looking at total signal or median signal and normalizing that way, um, this combat is one we have used uh, not all the time, but we use often uh, to count for batch effects in our data. Uh, and one advantage is it does actually really well and so you can often see if your metric is principal component analysis and you see different clumps based on your runtime or maybe your extraction batch or whatever uh, in a principal component uh, 
you know, plot. After combat, it'll go like shunk. Often, we'll reduce those those variation on batch. Um, but many times, it's not in an intuitive way, and so it's somewhat black box like. Uh, you can certainly go back and figure out how it did it, but it is a lot more work to figure out how it did it. Uh, and so we often just be like, oh, combat, and my data is normalized, and and go on with life. Uh, I don't know if you had any experience, Ed, with using any other batch correction tools or combat. Um, we, we, we have, a, we've used that one a little bit. We, I don't think we've published anything using combat. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's uh, for the, for the right situation, it can be a very, very powerful tool to use. I think in the cases when we've looked at, this is one case where I mentioned like with normalization, every time you do the normalization, you're making certain assumptions about the nature of the data, the nature of the, the experiment and so forth. If I remember right, combat, combat makes fairly strong assumptions about certain aspects of the data in order to work things out. And I think when we looked at this in the past, we found that the, those assumptions were a little bit too strong mm -hmm. for the for the nature of the data that we were putting in. Like it, it was over normalizing, so to speak. And so we, we've we've tried it, and then we've you know, gone back to simpler methods because it seems to be more robust or or better, so I would say it's it's definitely it could be uh, a method that's worth considering. Uh, but like any normalization method, it's it's always good to uh, you know go into it you know with with a healthy I guess you know try it but with a healthy degree of skepticism with an idea about what it's doing and then some way of you know that you decide ideally beforehand of judging like is it making things better or worse because you know sometimes um, sometimes normalization can cause problems as much as it can uh, can fix them. That's actually a good point to think about um, having different metrics to view it out. I know we have gotten into situations where we often use relative standard deviation of our controls or the overall principal component analysis plot uh, and use that as a metric of did I remove batch effects? But probably like the better strategy is also to look at another like biologically meaningful thing that you expect to see, um, you know, have a, a good positive control and make sure that that still is persists in your data, um, even after normalization strategies. So uh, versus taking a, a broad global view at like, oh, I got rid of batch effects, but maybe I caused more problems. Um, so, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, looking at looking at controls is an excellent thing to look at. Like if you you've um, ideally, you're going to have uh, you know some sort of control sample built in with every every batch or every block or something like that uh, on some regular basis, and so looking to make sure that those still look alike. If you like, if you have replicates built into the experiment, how well do the replicates go together? That's that's an important thing you can look at. You should have replicates, I should add, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and also then uh, um, yeah, like like things like just in general, do the different. Um, uh, you know, do the different conditions, uh, you know, go together? Uh, does that all all make sense? And that's, yeah, I think those are those are important things. No matter what approach you take, whether it's combat, whether it's uh, some other approach for normalization. Uh, sort of in along with that question, we have um, one in the chat. What's your philosophy on knowing when your normalization slash manual validation algorithm is good enough? Um, it's possible to optimize and reanalyze endlessly. So how do you prevent this? Are there any specific metrics you can provide a stopping point? Um, yeah, I would agree. It's very easy to get into this for months long normalization process uh, and never actually look into the biology because you're so focused on oh, getting rid of this technical variance. Um, uh, I don't know, Ed, do you have metrics? I think relative standard deviation is one we often look at and looking at a sort of a global view. Um, that's more for the technical, you know, normally that technical variation, but. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, those, yeah, looking at relative standard deviations, uh, um, that sort of thing. A big one being basically like if, if you look at, if you look at the batches, if you look at the overall clustering, have you managed to, Get the data not to cluster based on batch, but to cluster based on something else. Maybe you have some idea what that should be. Like you've got, 
you know, control and different treatments, do those cluster together? And then do the treatments that are most similar, you know, cluster accordingly? Like you can look at that sort of thing. I definitely agree that um, it's a good idea to have some idea ahead of time because you're right. Once you get buried in the, the cycle of, of doing normalization, there's always one more thing to try and you can drive yourself crazy um, just not knowing when to quit. So it's, it's definitely one of those things where I'd say if you go into it with some ideas like I don't want I want, I want the the major variation in the data set to not be driven by the batches. I want it to be driven by the the experiment, by biology. That's 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 a that's a good first one. I want my controls to look good, to cluster together. I want my treatments, you know, to you know, to you know be most similar to their own replicates and not other things. But once you get that, then it, it's it's definitely a case where it's like if you've achieved those goals, you're probably good enough. Maybe there's a better method out there somewhere. But you've reached the point where you can move forward with the data and 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 use it to learn interesting things. And so, I guess that would be my advice: is once you've achieved those those goals, then start working with the data. And and you know, and you may sometimes you 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 move on. You start doing your biology analysis, and you start to find things that look a little strange. And then you go back and realize there's something else you have to normalize for. So there can be a little bit of circularity there, but. Um, yeah, you know, that that's okay. I, I would say once once you've achieved the initial goals you have for the normalization, then it's a good time to say, okay, time to move on, and um, start doing the um, the the biology analysis or other other you know whatever the, the analysis is geared to the experiment. So here's a little bit of a uh, let's say counterpoint to this is like, is there a case where you would say give up on normalization? Uh, is there situations where this this batch effect or this one sample is never going to go into quote normal range? Um, and what do you do in those situations? Uh, do you iterate ad nauseum, or uh, you make some choice to remove data, or um, and maybe ways to consider that, or or um, decide? That's good. That's a good point. Like there, there are things normalization can't fix. Like um, if if a sample just for whatever reason like really didn't work. Like you, you've got, I mean, in the world of proteomics, if you got like fivefold, tenfold less protein in that particular run or that particular TMT channel than the others, normalization is not gonna not gonna be able to help you recover that. And so sometimes you do have to throw things throw things out. Um, sometimes you go through and, and you know the abundance is right, but like some sample just really doesn't cluster the way you expect. And so um, yeah, how, how you handle that can can uh, can be an interesting uh, interesting question. Like sometimes you do have to just leave samples out. I will add sometimes there have been a couple of cases where we've seen data that we're working up and they won't cluster right. And we look at it and we wonder what's what's going on here. One case in particular, we traced it down because you know we were we were doing an experiment with mice and we expected it to cluster based on like male versus female, and then there was a treatment involved, and we didn't see there was this one sample that or that just would not cluster at all and, and with, with where it should be. We looked into it, turns out the the alkylation step had failed. And so all the cysteine containing peptides were just gone. In that particular step, and so it took it took us you know and an, an, uh, more time than you might think to figure out what had happened. It was actually it was not just one sample; it was a whole batch of samples that just, like just weren't alkylated properly. And so now that is the sort of thing you can't necessarily fix. Um, normalization, there's no way that can that can fix that. So if if you're looking at your data and no matter what you do, the normalization isn't taking care of it, or if you have a sample that really looks like it's out in left field, I'd, I'd pay attention to it. Yeah, you know, because it may be telling you something that's important. It could be that the the run just wasn't good, and you need to throw the channel out. Sometimes it can be tell you telling you something else about the um, the samples being like something going wrong during the sample prep. We've even had cases where the uh, you know the analysis reveals to us that sample labels were swapped along the way, uh, and things like that. And so normalization can't fix everything. If there's something that just isn't going to work, like if if you're having to go to heroic lengths to try to make some sample work. It, you know, it should start asking some questions. Why and and uh, and frequently you're better off just leaving those out because there could be something that's going on. Sometimes you don't even necessarily figure out what it is. It's just something wasn't right about it, and so you're better off just excluding that one and and moving on. Or certainly, I should also add, if you know something went wrong with the sample, 
or like, you know, so like it, the run just didn't look good. There was some issue with it. Yeah, I might throw it out anyway, even if the normalization kind of looks OK, because like if you know that there's a problem, you know, you're, you're, you're frequently better off um, getting rid of it rather than um, trying to keep it and having it cause subtle issues down the line. Yeah, and the sooner you can kind of assess that situation as you're collecting data, maybe you can recover that and recollect the data immediately, uh, you know, so you don't have a gap in data collection. Um, so having some sort of strategy early on, like if, if you are in the luxury of actually collecting data on a mass spec and having a way of assessing the quality of that data as it's coming off, can get you out of some some bad situations like that where a sample is, you know, the the alkylation step was missing. Well, maybe you have extra sample, you can actually redo it and and sort of keep it on the same column with the same mobile phases and um, same instrument. If you're catching that a year later, uh, you know, you're, you are going to you be stuck with just removing that entirely from your analysis. Checking to see if there's any other. <clears throat> did we do we miss any of the questions? In the, oh, um, I think on the chat we are caught up. Um, we can go on to another one that's in our our list of questions. Um, so some strategies to integrate multiomics data, or maybe different data types that you're trying to combine. Yeah, so this is an excellent question. I think it's it's one of the uh, is the different Romics technologies are are maturing. This is a huge opportunity in the field, and uh, so I mean it does become somewhat specific depending on the the exact nature of the data and the experiment. But one useful strategy uh, that we actually mentioned earlier is uh, doing correlation analysis. So if you've got a bunch of different samples and you measure protein expression across those different uh, samples, and then you also have um, maybe it's metabolite levels or phosphopeptide levels or, or phosphorylation site levels or something like that. It can be very, very interesting and very informative to just do correlations, uh, see which proteins correlate with which, um, you know, which metabolites or which phosphopeptides or phosphoproteins. And that, that can, on its own, uh, oftentimes yield some interesting insights, particularly in the context if you're looking at like Maybe it's different yeast knockouts as the Coon Lab has done, or um, you know, different cancer cell lines that that as CCLE has done. Um, there's actually the, the people have uh, I've seen some interesting studies where people have done this in the context of genomics, um, where that like with the DO with DO mouse projects or things like that, where you can take these mice that have been bred in such a way that um, you so you start with eight different parental strains. Um, breathe them together to get different DL mice that have different um, genetic contributions from different strains at each position in the genome, and they've got several hundred of these. So you can measure protein expression and correlate the protein expression against the genome markers in each mouse, and you can do um, QTL analysis, which has been a very powerful approach. So um, all of that is sort of falls into the same category of correlating one um, one variable protein expression or something like that with another variable in another um, type of multiomics data. Um, that's that's like one general strategy that I would look at. Another useful thing can be like network analysis. So um, there are lots of different types of networks that one can can derive. Uh, protein interaction networks, whether you go to BioGrid or to go to our Bioplex data base or something like that, you can get information on which proteins interact with which other proteins. And then you can take this network and you can overlay other types of data. So maybe it's which proteins were up uh, upregulated under a partic particular set of conditions. So you can layer that under the network and then look for clusters or communities that are enriched for that particular category. That can be a useful general strategy. Um, you're not limited to protein interaction networks and this sort of thing. You can take protein expression data and make correlation networks, and then you can do a lot of the same types of tricks. Um, you can use networks that have been predefined, things like keg pathways or um, 
or that sort of thing, which can uh, can be informative as well. Um, those are some of some of my fa favorite strategies, uh, although in that it, it, it does often uh, depend a bit on, on the specific circumstances as well. You can get like kinase um, substrate relationships. There's some databases you can pull some of that information from which you can work with work with as well. Uh, I guess that's that those are a couple of my uh, go to approaches. Yeah, I would totally agree with you and you have beautiful network data, so I feel like you use that tool uh, quite well. Um, uh, I have done the same in, in sort of my strategies for multi omics integration and I'd like to second that idea of using databases and I think as as the community has more and more data that are feeding into those databases, those are going to continue to improve. I know some are you know, better annotated than others. If you're using human data sets, probably many things are have annotated functions. If you go into some, um, you know, sort of uh, unusual animal model or, 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 you know, model system that you're working with, maybe those are less well annotated. I would say also in, in metabolomics, lipidomics, we often have cases where we have an unknown thing. Um, I think eventually we're going to get to where those things are known and then we're going to have information about their functional uh, characteristics and then can integrate that data into um, the measurements that we're seeing. And your data, I, I think correlation is, an, is, is also excellent at trying to figure out those functions. Um, so correlating some uh, metabolite, I particularly like metabolites, I'm much more metabolite, lomic centric person, um, but I think even, you know, some orthogonal piece of information like Phospho proteins can give you information about kinases, and if you start to integrate these data, even with the correlation analysis, you might be able to infer function of um, of proteins or genes. Yeah. Excellent. So I think I have maybe maybe one more question. Um, in the slide deck, so we're, we're pretty good on time here. And this is when do I use parametric versus non-parametric tests? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So th this is yeah, this is an important one. Um, so yeah, so there there are two different types of statistical tests. There are parametric tests that make um, that that. Uh, involve making lots of assumptions about the data, how the data are distributed. Frequently, they're assuming that uh, variables are normally distributed, um, or they'll assume that variables are not correlated in any way, uh, things things like that, that will be important for uh, because you know, these assumptions go into the specific calculations that ultimately give you the p-values that you get out of your statistical test. And so if you deviate from these assumptions, then sometimes this can cause your p-values to be less accurate, and this can lead to issues. And an alternative way to go is there are other types of tests, non-parametric tests, that make less restrictive assumptions, let fewer assumptions about the distributions, or maybe they get around making assumptions altogether by doing computer-based simulations, randomizing your data to get null distributions and things like that. And so, this, this can be important because if you look at proteomics data and things, or really omics data in general, the way that we tend to do it, um, there are a lot of cases where, uh, strictly speaking, our data might violate some of these uh, parametric assumptions. Now, this, you know, when, when does this matter and when does it not matter? So it depends a little bit like, uh, when you have small numbers of replicates, it matters more than when, when you don't because, um, is you get more and more replicates generally, like you you tend to, like uh, thanks to the central limit theorem, you tend to move toward the idea that you're, uh, um, you know, approximating normal distributions and things as you get more and more data. And so that tends to help. Um, there are other cases, even when you're running relatively small experiments, you know, maybe only four or five replicates or something like that in a group. Um, depending on the statistical test, there's some statistical tests that are strictly that technically they're parametric, but the reality is that people have found that they're fairly robust to reasonable um, uh, deviations from from the assumptions. So maybe your data isn't strictly normal, but is but is kind of roughly bell shaped. So you can kind of get away uh, with these sorts of things. Um, what I tend to say is that if you're working with small amounts of data and um, 
or, or, or you know, experiments where the numbers of replicates are limited and so forth. Um, but it is one of these cases where the test is reasonably robust. Then if you use the parametric test, you, you maybe you can probably get away with it. But the more you deviate from the assumptions, the more the suspicion you should take when viewing the data or viewing the output, like the p-values and so forth. If uh, you know at some point, you know if you might have to realize that although you know the small p-values will still be the proteins that are of interest in that they differ a lot between the two conditions you're looking at uh, relative to the amount of variability between them, the the p-value may not you know if they say it's p-value smaller than 0.01, maybe that's really a 0.05 or 0.1 or something like that. Um, so it's important to recognize when you're starting to uh, push the bounds of the statistical test that the literal meaning of the p-value may not be what you think it is. And so maybe you can still use it reasonably for ranking the different hits that you have and saying, you know, this one is my most confident, but you know, saying precisely specifying how confident you are may be problematic. When possible, I actually do encourage people to use non-parametric tests. This is one thing where in proteomics data, one thing that works against us is the amount of data that we have in terms of multiple testing correction and things like that. But one advantage that we have is we have so much data that it's easy to do non-parametric tests in many cases, use the computer to randomize the labels, um, do the test multiple times and get a sense of your, uh, of your you know, basically to generate empirical p-values. And this way, you can do this in such a way that you don't have to worry so much about um, the, you know, what assumptions are going into it, how your data are distributed, because you're building that into your into your uh, simulation, so to speak. And so, whenever possible, to be honest with you, I will encourage people, and and I, and I will do this myself. I will do simulations, do empirical things like that, because it will be more robust to um, in unusual correlations in your data or um, just you know the, the 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 idiosyncrasies of your that might be present in your data set. So I'm a big fan of that. I would totally second that uh, permutation based or the where you randomize your labels to get p values out. Um, I have had good success with that, and particularly when when you have low sample numbers or um, maybe you're kind of comparing multiple different kinds of conditions where you have extreme changes in one and less extreme changes in the other. Um, I definitely had situations where I had the same amount of change uh, and one was significant and one was not because in one condition I had many other significant things, right? And so sort of relatively how significant it was ended up getting reduced. And so some sort of empirical based permutation based strategy can can help with that. Um, another thing is I would recommend people just plot their data and know what their distributions are. I think. Um, that can be just really helpful uh, to, to get a sense of, um, you know, what, what your distributions look like. I have even gone to using non-normal distributions when modeling data, so gamma distributions. I know in um, uh, RNA world or DNA world, they'll use negative binomial distributions. And so thinking about what kind of distribution models your data best can, can help with that. But it looks like we're almost uh, done with this uh, session. Um, thank you everyone for the excellent questions and thank you Ed for the really good insight and some useful tips for when people are tackling some data analysis stuff. Thank you. It's, it's been, uh, I've enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the chat and I look forward to uh, speaking later today.